Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that you guide us tonight. And um, Lord, make this helpful. Make it everlastingly helpful. Lord, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. I want to look at a just a just a sort of an off the wall topic just for a few minutes. And I want to run you through some verses. And then I want to explain uh, why I did that. And I'm, I want to actually sort of put some tools in your hands tonight that will help you um, as you read your Bible. Um, and it will help you to know your Bible. So uh, all that said, let's look at 1 Peter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things. Redeemed, of course, that's a reference to being saved, but it's the thought of being bought. We were bought with the price. We were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now we read that and, uh, you know, we understand that. We understand that we are, we are bought with the price. We actually talked about that a few weeks ago. But I want you to see another thought that pops up. And that's in 2 Peter chapter 2. We are bought, but somebody else is bought. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And you read that and you might think, well, maybe that's just talking about teachers that went, went off the rails. You know, they're really saved, but they went off the rails. But as you read down through this chapter, you realize he's referring to false teachers that are lost. And you see that in verse 17. Through this whole chapter, he's describing them. And in verse 17, he says, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. So the guys he's talking about in this passage are false teachers, but they're not Christians that just got mixed up and went astray. These guys are false teachers and they are lost. So uh, that brings me back to verse 1 there of chapter 2. It says they will bring in, look about halfway through the verse, they will bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Now with that in mind, I want you to look at Hebrews. Just go back to your left just a few pages and you'll see the book of Hebrews. And look at Hebrews chapter 2. And the thought there in chapter 2, verse 1, about these false teachers that are lost is, is, you know, not only was Jesus' blood enough to save us, He paid the sin debt for all men for all time, saved or lost. Um, he paid the sin debt. He, as we're going to see, look at Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. There it is. Okay, Jesus Christ was crucified for all men. But, but there's guys that will dispute that. Um, there is actually a whole lot of, of um, you know, good people that they, they believe the doctrine of I'm going to I'm going to, it's Calvinism. Some of you don't know what that is. Um, it's uh, a man named John Calvin way back centuries ago, and actually he wasn't the first. There was a man way before him named Augustine, and both of them began to promote this thought that um, God decided who would be saved and who would not be, and um, and God chose those people. And that Jesus shed his blood, but he only shed enough blood to save them. And that in their scheme of thinking, that's called limited atonement. They believe that Jesus' blood was only shed for the elect. Okay? And, uh, and they'll argue with you and go round and round with you and all that. And um, 
So what I want to do for the next few minutes is I just want you to see what the Bible says. Okay? And, and I'm going somewhere with this, doing this for a reason. Hebrews 2, look at verse 9 again. Let's see it again. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now here's what those guys will say. They'll say, well, you know, we know that the Bible says that Christ died for all and and um, but we believe that 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 just means Christ died for all of the elect. So that's how they get around all that. So here it says Christ tasted death for every man. So here's what they do. They'll say, well, of course, that means the elect. So that that's that's going to be their answer to that. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that without having a battle of wits, you know, and and, you know, you're trying to out argue them and all that stuff. Um, let me just say this. A lot of times. You're going you're gonna to waste a lot of time in argument with somebody like that. If, the, if you want to, if, if somebody has a different belief and you want to discuss that, and, and you know, um, um, but if you're sort of going nowhere and, and you're not going to, um, you know, you're sort of wasting your time. But you do need to know the answer yourself. Like, you're going to walk away, especially if one of these guys really knows their position inside and out, and they start, you know, firing some scripture at you. You're going to walk away going, wow, maybe, maybe, maybe they're right. How do you know? I'm going to show you how you know. It's really simple. God wrote this book to where if you will read it and just do some very simple things... The Bible explains itself, and thank God it does. Um, Peter said, the Scripture is of no private interpretation. In other words, there's nobody out there somewhere that says, well, I've got the corner on truth, and you really won't understand it unless you come to me. Well, God set this up to where we didn't have to, we didn't have to live like that. We didn't have to be at the mercy of somebody somewhere that has six degrees behind their name and feel intimidated. God said, no, I gave you my book, and that's enough. So let's, let's do something for a few minutes. Okay, I don't want to zero in on the thought, every man. He tasted death for every man. Okay, so, so the key words are every man. What, what does that mean? What does that mean? All right, keep your place there, but go with me to Genesis chapter 7. And, you know, this will be true of many different false doctrines that are out there. You know, people will say this and that, and you'll hear people on the Internet, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and people say all sorts of things. But there is a way to measure. There is a way to measure. There's a way to know. Every man. What does the phrase every man mean? Well, you think, well, it really should, should mean the obvious. Yeah, it should, but let's get some confirmation. Okay, Genesis 7. Now, this is the, uh, this is the story of the flood, Noah's flood. Um, look at verse 17. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted, and it was lift up above the earth, and the waters prevailed and were greatly increased upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. Okay, so it just continues on down. Look at verse 21. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Okay, so just a quick question. Okay, do you, do you have any doubt what that means? I mean, that's not mystical. Not, 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 that's not deeply scientific, right? You don't read that and go, wow, wonder what that means. You don't, that's not what you do with that. So, so with that in mind, let's read all the rest of the verse just like that. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast, of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life, of all that was in the dry land died. It said, every man. That's pretty self-explanatory, right? You, nobody has to, nobody says, man, we better run to the Hebrew on that one. No, it's really, really clear, is it not? Okay, look at uh, Genesis 9. Genesis 9. 
God makes a, a new covenant with Noah after the flood. And um, Genesis 9, verse 5, And surely your blood of your lives... Well, okay, let's, let's go back to verse 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. You know, God never had any trouble with people eating meat. But it's really interesting. From one end of the Bible to the other, God says, don't you drink that blood. Okay? And there's reasons for that. And, and it's interesting that the satanic rituals involve the drinking of blood. So it's really interesting. But, but I mean, all the way back to Noah, God says, don't you drink that blood. Okay? So let's read it. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. That is a prohibition against murder. Okay? And notice what God said. Well, let's think back to Cain and Abel in the garden. You know, Cain rises up and kills Abel. And God speaks to Cain and he says, Your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And God required Abel's blood from Cain. He said, What in the world have you done? Okay? But notice here, at the end of verse 5, At the hand of every man's brother, every man, so, you know, it's really obvious there. There's no exception. There's nobody that gets off the hook on that one. This, this was binding on every man. Look at Genesis 17. Now, the Lord is speaking here to Abraham. And, uh, man, he is talking about the, uh, the, the seed that will come from him. And, and, you know, the, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the whole Israeli nation will come from Abraham. And um, in Genesis 17, verse 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Now from the context of that, we know that it, it's restricted to, to uh, the seed of Abraham. But again, he says here, Every man. So there was going to be no exception to that among Abraham's descendants. It was every single person. So everywhere we've looked at this phrase, it means everybody inclusive. Look at um, Genesis 42. Joseph's brothers have come to see him. And, and of course, Joseph is now the second in control in the whole land of Egypt. He is, he is under Pharaoh. He is the ruler of the nation. And, uh, you know, a lot of years have lapsed, and Joseph's brothers don't recognize him. So um, look at what happens in verse 25. Genesis 42, verse 25. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. Now, of course, from the context, it's really obvious this, this group is Joseph's brothers. But was there anybody exempt in the group? No. The command was to put the money. He didn't, he didn't name four or five of them. He didn't say, you know, do most of them. When he said every man sack, that, was, that meant every one of them without exception. Every one of them. Go to Psalm 39. Psalm 39. So every one of those passages we looked at, and, and uh, uh, every man, that phrase, you know, it was very obvious. It, it, there was no, you don't have to scratch your head. You don't suddenly make it mean something else. It's very obvious. Look at Psalm 39. Verse 5, David said, 
Behold, thou hast made my days as in handbreadth. In other words, you're about as wide as your hand. In other words, it's a very small thing. And mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. He uses that phrase, every man. And as you read it, Maybe you see something there I don't see, but I, I don't see any, anything that points to any exceptions to that anywhere on the globe or in history. You know, if, if the Lord had wanted to, to seclude it to a certain group or to a certain time period or whatever, you know, He could have said that, but He didn't. He said, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Look at Proverbs 24, verse 12. Proverbs 24. Verse 12. Um, verse 11. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn into death. In other words, he's saying, um, he's saying here's somebody and they're, they're going to get killed, but you have the capability to step in on their behalf. You have the ability to save their life. But instead, you forbear. You decide to look the other way. Okay? If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? That's a reference to God. Only God knows the hearts. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Now I have a question. Okay, um, again, is there, when you see the phrase, every man at the end of verse 12, and shall not he render to every man according to his works? Is there any exceptions to that? Like, is there any, anything in that passage that points there, that there's any sort of an exception anywhere in that phrase? Any reason why it wouldn't mean every man? Everybody's really quiet. Everybody's afraid to answer. This, this is not a trick question. <laughs> is there any reason why it's not every man? No, you read that and you think of God. God is the righteous judge. God doesn't hold people by different standards. He is no respecter of persons. And He will render to every man according to His works. Look at John, the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So he tasted death for every man. Somebody says, well, you know, he only died for the elect. Okay, um, um, so, so I look at Hebrews 2, and I remember being on the street one day, and, and I was talking to a, to a Calvinist, and uh, we were just chatting away. He found out we were believers, and somehow he, you could tell he was just testing the waters. He was just um, starting to wade into that Calvinist doctrine, and um, he threw a couple questions at me, and uh, he wasn't... He wasn't trying to be ignorant. He wasn't trying to be rude. He wasn't trying to make me look stupid. But he was, you could tell he was curious. And I looked at him and I said, Well, the Bible does say he tasted death for every man. And as soon as I said that, his reaction was amazing. It revealed that he wasn't beyond hope. All of a sudden he went, Wow. The Bible does say that, doesn't it? which is the right reaction. Otherwise, you start forcing a belief on the Scripture and you've got to explain away all the verses that don't match your belief. The Scripture is very clear. Look at, um, where are we at? John 1, okay? People often ask, what about the heathen? You know, what, what's going to happen to the heathen in the jungle that have never heard the gospel? And uh, that's a good question, okay? And that's sort of a big question. We don't have a lot of time for that tonight. But John 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And he's talking about John the Baptist. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. That's a capital L. Who is that? Jesus, Jesus Christ, yeah. To bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He, John, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. 
That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Very obvious it's talking about receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's an interesting statement in verse 9. Speaking of Jesus Christ. That was the true light. He's, he's talking about that light, okay? Which Jesus was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You know, I don't understand all that and I understand how God does this and there's many stories about things like this. But you know, God, somehow God gives every man a chance at some point in his life. Even if he's in the deepest darkest jungle of whatever country you want to name, Africa or New Guinea or wherever. You know what God does? He, he, he gives every man some light. And if they'll respond to that light, He gives them more light. There are many, many accounts of tribal guys, tribal people in, these, in the darkness of some jungle somewhere that had never come across a missionary, never come across a witness of any kind, steeped in their demonism. And they'd climb a tree. I, I got a story at home of one. He, he, he climbed up a tree and he looked up at the sky and he said, is there anybody there? He said, if there's anybody... See, he knew about spirits and demons and devils and what he worshipped. He knew all about that. But he thought, there's got to be something better. And he climbed to the top of the tree and he said, if there's somebody out there, would you speak to me? Man, it wasn't long. A missionary walked into that village and gave him the gospel and he got converted and half the tribe got converted. And, and do you realize how many times that story has occurred? They realized. I heard somebody's testimony just recently. Um, a guy here in Canada, and a guy grew up here in Canada, and and he was uh, he was out. Um, he was he was partying. He was a drunkard. He was just he, he was you know loop, you know destroying his brain and his body, and and um, he got kicked out of his house, and he got a job working a few hours out in the bush at a um, sort of like a a bush camp for, you know, tourists and hunters and all that stuff. And, um, and he said one day when he was out there, he, um, he decided he was going to kill himself. And he said, I got a piece of rope. And he said, I went out in the woods. He said, I was going to hang myself. And he said, I got out in the woods. And I thought, he said, I thought, could there be a God? And he said, I cried out to God. And he said, all I can tell you is, he said, honest to goodness, he told me. He said, honest to goodness, all I can tell you is, one thought came through my head, and that was, and he said, I didn't grow up in church. He said, I didn't know any of this stuff. He said, a thought went through my head that the answer was Jesus Christ. And he said, I cried out to Jesus Christ. He said, something happened to me. He said, I didn't even understand it. He said, I went back to my tent that night, and he said, I cried all night long. But he said, but I was a new man. You know who Jesus is? He's the true light that lighteth every man. Nobody on Judgment Day will say, but this isn't fair. You didn't give me a chance. That will not be heard on Judgment Day. You'll hear it now. And I love what uh, Ray Comfort said. Ray Comfort said, you know, he'd be out there on the street witnessing to people. And he'd be telling people, and some, some smart aleck would say, well, if you really believe all this, you know, you know, what about, what about all those people in the jungle? And Ray Comfort said, well, if you care about those people in the jungle, why don't you go tell them? <laughs> They don't care about those people in the jungle. <laughs> Who does Jesus give light to? Look at verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man. Every man that cometh into the world. What a blessing. What a blessing. So here's what we've done tonight. We have looked at a bunch of uh, verses, and we've, we've looked for the answer. Look at it one more time to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. So, you know, I, without, without, uh, um, without 
hanging myself on some scholar somewhere that that claims he has the answer and I have to learn this whole big doctrinal system and read all this Calvinist stuff and listen to all their teachers and you know you know it's just really simple it says Hebrews 2 verse 9 he was Jesus was crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man that's why he says in 2 Peter you know why those false teachers are really in trouble because they, they will stand in front of God and they trampled on the blood that bought them. The price was paid. Jesus tasted death for every man. So this is where I really want to go tonight. We're going to fly in the next few minutes. I want to talk to you for a few minutes on how to study your Bible. So if you got a pen and a paper and you want to write a few thoughts down, I'm going to give you eight or nine things that will help you. They're really simple. You know, some people think, oh, you know, and, and you know, I'm not knocking Bible school necessarily. Um, you know, that it, it, I'm not necessarily knocking that. That's not really the scriptural way, but, it, but it, you know, some people go there and they, they get some help there. But you know what? You know what? You can know your Bible and uh, you can get to know it and it doesn't take forever um, and you don't have to go away somewhere. You know, God gave you His book, and it's right in your lap. And if you want to know this book, He will help you. And there's some really simple things. I spent a few years in Bible school, because I went there, and under different men, and they were good men. And they were trying to teach us the Bible so that we might know the Bible. And you know what they did? They taught us like someone had taught them, which is usually how you do that. Do that. But... You know, some of the guys that taught us, um, you know, the only thing they knew to do was to really quote their teachers or to quote a commentary, you know, and elaborate on that or to give us some outline that somebody else gave them. And, um, but every once in a while, um, you would come across somebody whose knowledge was altogether different. They seemed to know the Bible on a different level. And, and it, you know, if you were, if you pay, you were paying attention, you'd go, okay, wait a minute, this, this dude's got something. You know, he's, he, he really seems to know on a different level. Years ago, when our kids were small, Mitzi, Mitzi was playing with uh, the, our kids, and she was chasing them through the living room. And um, um, somebody had dropped a broken toothpick in the floor. My wife, um, for years... Uh, she always went barefoot, and um, except you know to church or to the store, <laughs> and uh, and her, her the bottoms of her feet were like leather. I envied her feet because mine are not. Mine are like cushy, <laughs> and um, hers were like leather. And um, but she went ripping across the floor, and as she ran, she hit that toothpick, a broken piece of toothpick, and it rammed up into her foot and broke. And, um, and, of course, then, became, then began the procedure of, well, let's get a needle and see if we can get it out. And, um, and you know what? It was, it, we, we couldn't even find it. Now, I don't mean it went up this way, but it went in this way. And we couldn't even find it. So, you know, it, it wasn't really killing her, and so a day or two went by. And, um, and then, <laughs> then I, I can't remember why, why, why we let it go. I guess, I guess we thought, you know what? We thought, you know, maybe it'll work its way out. That's, that's what we thought. Again, it's not like it went up this way, it, but it was ran pretty good at an angle. And um, so one day we wake up and she noticed she's got red streaks starting to go up her leg. Now, you know what that means? That's blood poisoning. I'm like, oh, okay. We got a problem. So we went to the emergency room. There was a young doctor there in the emergency room that day. And um, Mitzi's on the table. I'm sitting there, and, and the doc looks at it, you know, and he, gets, he sort of picks at it. And he gets a scalpel out, sort of goes to cut it a little bit. And it was, I'm, I'm telling you, it was obvious. He was very nervous. And it was like, you just got the distinct impression he did not know what he was doing, and he didn't know what to do next. And, um, you know, when he got the scalpel out and started cutting a little bit, we're sort of like, ah, you know, well, you know, maybe we'll go see our family doctor or something. We just figured we better get out of here. 
So, so we left, and um, I don't know if we waited a few hours or, or, or I can't remember how it played out, but we, or maybe we went to another hospital. That's probably what we did. We went to another hospital, went to the emergency room. As we went into that emergency room, we met doctor number two. What a difference. Doctor number two walked in. He was a middle-aged man, uh, just a, a really well-built, full head of gray hair. He walks in there very confidently. He looks at my wife's foot. And of course, he told us the obvious. He said, man, you got blood poisoning. And, um, and he said, oh, you know, he said, there's, there's, there's no sense in trying to, he said, we could surgically remove this. But he said, but there's no sense in doing that. He said, um, he said it is going to work its way out. But he said, um, but we need to get you on antibiotics right away. And, uh, and he did. He got, got Mitzi on antibiotics. And literally a few days later, poof, it came out. But what a difference in the demeanor of the two doctors. What a difference in the confidence. Man, that second doc, I mean, literally as he walked in the room, looked at Mitzi's foot, before he even said a word, I thought, this guy knows what he's doing. Um, and there are people that, that that's how they, they, uh, they handle the Bible. Some people, they really know what they're doing and what they're seeing. And other people, they're just repeating something that they heard somewhere. And you hear their answer to certain things, you're just going... Yeah, okay, whatever. I'm not sure about that. You know, there's just something is missing. Some people have Bible answers to things, and some people have a textbook answer. Um, often, you know, you'll ask them a, a very uh, a sticky question, a very controversial question, and they'll come back with an answer that's unclear, it's vague, uh, even their answer raises other questions, and they have no Bible answer. So let me give you an example of that real quick. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Now, I'm going to give you some very distinct things to write down. Okay, so I'm, right now I'm just making a few, in, just a few remarks along the way. But let me give you an example of um, getting a Bible answer and getting the textbook answer. Okay? Matthew 19... Verse 3, the Pharisees also came unto him, unto Jesus, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, boy, that was a loaded question. And it's still a loaded question today, that whole divorce and remarriage question. And, um, and so Jesus begins to deal with that. He says in verse 4, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said... For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? That was a valid question. Now we know their, their reason for asking that question was crooked. Okay? But, but it was a valid question. Okay? Verse 8, Jesus answers, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Now watch this verse. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now, this is really a big topic, and, and you know, there's, there's times through the years we've actually, we've actually taken a whole evening just look at what the Bible says, okay? But what I'm going to do at the moment, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to qualify all my statements, so I'm just going to make a statement or two, and then I want you to see, I'm, I'm going somewhere with a word that shows up in this verse, okay? So there are guys out there, and there's Baptists, that believe that um, um, anybody in the church that's divorced is a second-class citizen. Uh, like, and they will not say that, but that's the way it is. Uh, that's the way they treat you. That's just the way it works. And they don't believe that um, divorce and remarriage is ever an option under any, under any circumstances. And they believe the Bible's dead set against it on every occasion. And they'll point to a few verses. And if all you hear them say are those few verses, you go, oh, wow. Um, like I, I remember growing up as a kid. And, there, and you know, th this whole thing gets sticky, you know. Well, they say, well, uh, a preacher can't be divorced and remarried. And then they'll say, and of course a deacon can't be divorced and remarried. But then they take it further. Well, you know, could a Sunday school teacher teach if she's been divorced and remarried? And, and then, and, then um, and I remember as a kid, a church we attended where there was a, a school teacher. Um, it was a big church, and a woman that taught school at, at the church that I went to 
um, she taught she taught school at a nearby elementary school, and she was divorced, and they wouldn't even let her sing in the choir. Of course, they let her take they take her money, which is convenient. <laughs> I smell a rat. But um, but um, but they wouldn't even let her sing in the choir. That's how radical this stuff gets. And so what they do is when they come across a verse that that sort of puts a quandary on their interpretation, they have to come up with an answer because somebody's going to ask a question. And this verse causes them a little grief. Let's look at it. Verse 9, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another. See, a lot of these guys, they don't believe there's any exceptions at all. And so when you show them this, and recently this popped up at a church service uh, in another church a ways from here and through the grapevine, I, I heard about it. And it was funny, when the preacher got cornered on it, he immediately did a tap dance, and he's a good guy, but he immediately did a tap dance and ran for the hills and never really did answer the question. <laughs> Except it be for fornication. So you, you look at these dudes and you say, okay, see there? Now God, Jesus Christ, obviously gives one exception right there. And here's where you'll get the textbook answer. They'll say, well, well, fornication, you know, that's, that's only before marriage, you know. And they'll say, you know, under Jewish customs, and boy, you got to beware of guys that run with that. Jewish customs are instrumental. You learn things, the Lord alludes to them, all that. But that's not our final authority. And they'll say, well, you know, you know, under Old Testament law, they were betrothed, you know, like Mary and Joseph. Um, Joseph, Mary was great with child, and, and um, Mary was his espoused wife, so they were betrothed. And so there was that period of betrothal, let's say it was a year, before they were married. And under Old Testament law, once you were betrothed, um, that you were treated as if you were married. So if that gal sleeps with somebody else while you're betrothed, then they actually had to do a divorce procedure, which under Old Testament law, that's, that was the way it worked. Okay? Um, and so immediately, they have justified their position. But the question is, what does the word fornication mean? Does it only mean this, you know, because... You know, this gal and this guy, they really weren't married yet, and so they did this. And then, you know, she, she did this, and so on the honeymoon night, I don't understand all this. They said on the honeymoon night, a lot of times uh, one of the priests would be waiting outside the tent. And she had to produce proof of her virginity. And there was a way that could be done. And if she couldn't produce proof of her virginity, like, you know, as she sleeps with her husband, if she can't bring out proof of, of, of that, then, oh, no, she was messing around. And so, you know, you can imagine where all that went. Well, they say that's fornication. It is, so let's see what the Bible says what fornication is. All right? Um, look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. Just real quick. Now, what you're seeing here, and again, I'm going to give you a few things to write down. What I'm giving you is a real example of one of the things we're going to look at. And I'll explain that in a moment. First Corinthians 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much named as, a, as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Okay, so obviously this is not just two single people. So suddenly the Bible has broadened the definition of fornication. But it goes way further than that. Look at the book of Jude. Book of Jude. Verse 5, Jude 1, verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as, now watch the wording, 
even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like ma manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh or set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Uh, you know, I know we're on camera and so I'm going to be real careful here, but, but everybody look at me and, and, and nod your head. Do, do you understand what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? Please nod your head. Yes. That was not a bunch of single teens that were just really out of bounds. So, so suddenly, as you begin to look at the Scripture, you begin to discover that there is a Bible answer and there's a textbook answer. And here's something you can have. You can have the Bible answer. So I'm going to tell you how to get the Bible answer on a lot of things. All right, ready? Here's the first one. First thing to write down. This is really, really difficult. This, this is three words. Read, read, read. <laughs> Read. <laughs> Isaiah 34, 16. Isaiah 34, 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. 1 Timothy 4, 13. Give attendance to reading. It is to reading. Be a Bible reader. You know, some people say, well, I'm not a reader and I can't read very well. Well, that may be. But you know what? If there's ever a book you need to work at reading, it's this one. This is God's book, and it's a big deal to Him. He landed it in your lap. It's the only book from that other world on this planet, and God gave it to you. You need to get, you, you get to know a book by reading. Some of you in this room are readers, and um, some of you are not. Um, I, years ago, uh, my sister walked out of her bedroom, and she had this, this, this novel she had been reading, and man, she must have really liked this thing. She came out of the room, and she said, and this thing was it was a volume. She goes, I finished it for the 15th time. And I'm like, good for you. <laughs> How do you get to know a book? By reading. Read, read, read. It's amazing how God will speak to you as you read. And it's amazing the things that will get untangled in, as you read. And you can pray and say, oh God, help me, help me, help me. And, 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 and I, let me tell you, it, it, you know, any reading is good from the Bible, but if you'll read somehow systematically, it's such a blessing that when you're reading systematically, you know, like, you know, we've got those Bible reading charts. We still got some, by the way. Um, and, it, and God speaks to you out of your regular reading. Then the devil can't get on your shoulder and go, well, that's really not for you because you were cherry picking. Say, what's cherry picking? That's when you go, oh, Lord, help me today. I'm not feeling good, so I'm going to read the Psalms again. Let's see. Uh, well, you know what? You might find a wonderful verse, but, but you know what? Sometimes you're, you're really going to really feel, uh, you're, you're, you're going to think, did the Lord really speak to me? But man, when it comes to you out of your regular reading, you know it was no accident. Okay, so read, read, read. Okay, here's the second thing. Ready? Notice places that are similar and mark them. Notice places that are similar and mark them. Um, a lot of you guys, a lot of you men in this church, you've got, you've got stuff written in your margin. I'm, my writing's really tiny, and I've got a, I've got a wide margin on purpose because I, I like a wide margin for that very reason. But he, uh, you know, you probably can't even see it. But I got some stuff in my margin, like right here. I've got a cross reference in my margin. I just wrote it right there out beside of another verse because I was reading. And I saw a verse, and it, oh yeah, it reminded me of somewhere else. So I, in my margin, I wrote Job 26, 7 through 9 and 10. And at Job 26, I've got written Psalm 108, 4. I met a man years ago that was phenomenal, unbelievable. And uh, he had read his Bible, it's like Brother Gip. Brother Gip just finished his Bible for the, like the 285th time, cover to cover. He goes through his Bible about once every six weeks. And he's done that for many, many years. Um, and he does it because he believes that book is supernatural. And he believes that book will help him. He does it for his own sake. Um, but I met a man, and uh, he, would, he would travel and preach. And, and uh, often on Saturday mornings, they would have a Saturday morning session. And, and he would step behind the pulpit, and it was announced in advance. And he would say, ask me any question, and I'll give you a scripture reference that deals with that thing in five seconds. 
And he did it. Well, I, I had a chance to talk to him privately one day. And I said, how did you get to know your Bible? And here's what he told me. He said, read your Bible from cover to cover. As you finish it, start again. As you finish it, start again. And he said, every time one verse reminds you of another verse, he said, write, write those cross-references in the margin. He said, over a little bit of time, he said, you'll begin to develop your own system of cross-references. And he said, the Bible will start coming together. So notice places that are similar and mark them and compare them. Let me give you another one. Ready? The third thing is, the, and, and I realize I'm going fast, so if you have a question after the service, please feel free you know, to come and ask me, okay? Um, there's another thing called the law of first mention. Okay, write that down, and I'm going to give you an example. The law of first mention. Okay, um, go with me real quick to Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. Genesis 9, verse 20. Okay, so this is right after the flood. And you know, Noah has just stepped off the ark with him and his sons, and a little time passes. And in Genesis 9, verse 20, it says, And Noah began to be an husbandman. In other words, he, what it says he planted a vineyard. Okay, so he began to grow grapes and, and whatever else. Verse 21, And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Okay, he got drunk. Next thing you know, he has no clothes on. And Ham, the father of Canaan, Ham was one of Noah's sons, saw the nakedness of his father, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without. Now, two, the other two brothers were standing outside the tent. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Now watch verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Not only did he see his father's nakedness, but something he did something. We're not told exactly what it was. So here's what I'm getting at. You know what shows up? In verse 21, the first mention in the Bible of the word wine. This is fermented wine, okay? Um, in the context, the Bible only uses one word. Um, the Bible uses the word wine. Sometimes that's grape juice. Sometimes it's literally grapes. Sometimes it's fermented liquor. And, and um, a lot of that hinges on the context. But you know where we're at today. We live in this world where... Um, um, you know, drinking liquor used to be taboo among independent Bible-believing Christians, um, but it has come in like a flood. And, uh, you know, everybody wants to fight for it and argue about it, and, oh, you know, a little bit's okay, and all that stuff. Okay, so, so how do you ever get to the bottom of that? How do you get to the bottom of that? Okay, one of the things you do is you look at what all the Bible has to say about it everywhere, okay? But what is it? It's interesting. The first place it shows up... The law of first mention. Many times, the first time something is mentioned in the Bible, it shows the general tenor, the general um, thought of how that thing shows up throughout the Bible. Most of the time in the Bible, fermented liquor shows up in a negative sense. The problem is there's a few passages that are a little confusing. But what do you do? Look at the first mention. What happens the first time wine shows up in Bible history, the guy gets drunk. He's a good man. Noah walked with God. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was spared from the flood. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. But he figures out how to make liquor and drink some. Next thing you know, he's drunk. Next thing you know, he's naked. Next thing you know, his son, his son does something to him in his drunken stupor. And the next thing you know, he's cursing his grandson. That's the first time it shows up. That's significant. Pay attention. Let me give you one more. Look at Genesis 14. Genesis 14. The first. Pay attention to the first time something shows up. Okay, let me say something right now before I forget. Okay, um, 
there is um, some of you are thinking, some of you are thinking, how do I, how do, I do this? How do I, how do I look these verses up? How do I find where these verses are? And that's a good question. So I'm going to tell you. Some of you would prefer, some of you would prefer to have a book, okay? Um, and, and there's a book called Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. I've got two or three extra copies. If you want one, you can have it. I've picked some of them up at thrift stores, okay? So they didn't cost me anything. I should say my wife picked them up at thrift stores, okay? Not me. I'm taking credit where it's not due. And um, so in that book, you can look up in, in the Strong's, the Cruden, there's the Crudens, there's the Young's, but they're not, they're not exhaustive. Strong's Concordance, if you look up the word wine, it will show you every single time the word wine appears from, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, it'll show you every time any word appears. I mean, it's this thick and the, the print's teeny tiny. But wow, is it helpful. Before I, had my, before I had my phone concordance, I always used the Strong's to look things up. Now, if you, if you would rather, you can get a concordance app. You type in the word, you know, you type in the word wine and... Uh, I'll type, no, I got, the, I got the Wi-Fi off on this thing. But type in the word wine, and I hit, hit, find, and it instantly, it'll tell me how many times, it'll say 572 times, and it'll show you every single reference. So if you want to do it that way, you can use your phone. There is, this is a very simple way. You can look up those words, you can find them. If you've never, ever done it in your life, suddenly it becomes very simple. Okay. Uh, Genesis 14. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with, and it tells about these other kings. Verse 3, all these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the salt sea. Now watch. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. That's the first mention of the word 13, okay? Um, is this another big subject all in itself? But Bible numbers have great significance. And I don't mean in a spooky sense. Sometimes people, some, sometimes people go off the deep end with some of that stuff. But for example, God, God made the earth in six days. On the seventh day, He rested. Okay, six is the number of man, okay? Um, the Antichrist, His number is 666. Okay, um, God made the earth in six days. The seventh day rested. You look at the number seven through the Bible. It's the number of completion. Man, when the number seven hits, something was completed. The number 13, very significant number. What's 13 connected with in this verse? Somebody tell me. Rebellion. Rebellion. Even in our society. Now, I know our society is goofy and they're superstitious, okay? But even in our society, 13 is an evil number. Do you know where they got that? From the Bible. You notice Jesus chose 12 disciples, not 13. And you get that, that first time that number appears. Let me give you another one. The number five is the, the number of five is the number of death. In Genesis 5, 5, the first natural death um, Let's look at it, Genesis 5 verse 5. The first natural death occurs in Genesis 5, verse 5. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Notice that's Genesis 5, verse 5. Do you know what chapter 5 of Genesis is filled with? Verse 8, look at the last three words, and he died. Look at verse 11, the last three words, and he died. Look at verse 14, the last three words, and he died. Look at verse 17, and he died. Genesis 5 is the number, Genesis, Genesis chapter 5. 5 is the number of death. And Genesis chapter 5 is filled with death. You know, uh, you know in, the, in the movies, you know, where they, you know where they stab the guy? They stab him under the fifth rib. You know when an airplane is going down, you know what they call over the radio? May day, May day. You know what May is, don't you? It's the fifth month. This stuff is uncanny. Okay? And... Um, but it's interesting to see where the first time 
where something shows up. And it is 10 till 9. So we got three things. Let me give you those three things again. The first one is read, read, read. The second one is notice things that are notice places that are similar and mark them, compare them, okay? And the third one is the law of first mention. If you will notice where something shows up in the Bible for the first time, you can get a pretty good idea of what God thinks about that thing throughout the rest of the scripture. So we're going to stop there for time's sake, and we got several more, and um, God willing, we'll do the next ones um, next week. Anybody got a quick question on that before, before we pray? All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Bless this truth. Lord, help us to, uh, to love your book, but Lord, I think, I think we do, Lord. We love your book, but Lord, help us. You said study to show yourself approved. Help us, Father. Lord, we don't need to depend on somebody else for that. We can search the Scriptures, Lord. You have given them to us. You have given us a book that explains itself if we will faithfully search it. God, bless these thoughts. May they be a help, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Amen.